All right, it looks like we are live. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to Plugged Into History. This is Let's Talk Tuesday. And here I am putting myself in front of the camera today here on this rainy day in South Carolina. Um, and I wanted to share with you all today some research that the foundation has been doing for a long time. So the foundation has been, of course, collecting the names of enslaved people who lived and worked here at Middleton Place. Um, and that includes the efforts to document people who ran away, people who self-emancipated. And so there has been research into today's subject, Lucy Danbury, um, for quite a long time. I just took a lot of the pieces that a lot of the researchers here for the foundation had been doing and tried to put them together. I did that because last summer in Philadelphia, there was a national conference given by the Sons of the American Revolution, and it was about women waging war. And it was specifically about the stories of women during the American Revolution, the American War for Independence. And I felt that Lucy Banbury's story was really a vital story to be told in that context. So I wanted to share that story with you all, and I wanted to share that context with you. Um, this presentation, just like all the other ones, will be available here on Facebook um, after this presentation is over, of course. So if you don't come in right at the beginning, no big deal. Just come on and um, check us out um, at another, you know, later on. Um, make sure you put your comments and questions in the questions section. And I'm going to see if I can bring up my own video here um, to make sure that I get your questions. There we are. Cool. Ah. <laughs> um, okay, so let me know what questions you have. And here in my own little one person Zoom meeting, I'm going to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint presentation for you. So this is research that um, is potentially looking to be published in a volume with other papers from the conference last summer. So I'll keep you all updated on that for sure when information comes out, uh, more details come out about that. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started here. And I want to share this screen and I'm going to move myself <laughs> over here. Okay. So let's see if that works. And I'm going to check out my I'm going to check out my live feed here to make sure that it works. This presentation is um, there it is great. This presentation, because it was given in Philadelphia and because it was given for a national um, conference, I didn't assume that everybody knew what Middleton Place was, where Middleton Place was, and what we do. So I went ahead and um, I created this first slide to share with people in Philadelphia who the foundation is. Um, of course, our nonprofit educational foundation since 1974, and the enslaved community has been interpreted here in some form or fashion since 75. Um, that doesn't mean, however, that we interpret it the same way. So it's really important that we understand that the interpretation of the enslaved community here at Middleton Place evolves. Uh, we really need to make sure that we keep evolving and um, telling the story the way that it needs to be told as a complete story, not as a separate piece of what's going on here. And um, we have had descendants of the enslaved community here on the board since the 1980s, and that continues today. So representation matters, and we want to improve that continually um, moving into the future. So a big part, of course, of the property here, if you've never been, 
is the Beyond the Fields exhibit, which is housed in Eliza's house, a Freedman's cottage that was built in 1871. And um, <laughs> my slideshow wants to proceed itself. Um, the mainstay of the Beyond the Fields exhibit is here in Eliza's house, this um, wall of names. It has over 2,800 names listed here of the enslaved population who were owned by the Middleton family um, over the course of a couple of hundred years. And this is actually an incomplete list. So like I said, research continues and we have many, many more names to add to the list. We're up over 3,000 now. So we have to continue with this exhibit and update it. All right, so John and Lucy, who were they? Um, Lucy wasn't alone. Lucy was married to a fellow named John Banbury. And as we trace Lucy's story in the historical record, we see John's paralleling with her. Um, in fact, we know sometimes more about John than we do about Lucy. But John and Lucy Banbury were two self-emancipated, formerly enslaved workers who were owned specifically by Declaration of Independence signer Arthur Middleton. So remember that many of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, men who were claiming that King George was enslaving the colonies, themselves were enslavers of people. And Arthur Middleton was one of them. And he enslaved John and Lucy Danbury. Um, they're actually not on the list of names in the Beyond the Fields exhibit, but they will be uh, sometime soon in the future. And their story is one of perseverance and determination. So we can talk about self-emancipating, running away as a really effective form of resistance. It's overt resistance uh, to the condition of enslavement. And as I talk a little bit today, we're gonna look at their decision-making process and um, the risk versus reward of deciding to run away and trying to figure out what choices they really had. So here's a timeline of John and Lucy's lives, such as we know them. Uh, there's not a whole lot to go on and we only have a few historical records, but we're gonna start here. So if you don't know anything about it, uh, we'll start with Lord Dunmore's proclamation. Lord Dunmore's proclamation was an offer of freedom to the enslaved people of Virginia. And when Dunmore's proclamation made its way through the colonies in late 1775, networks of communication between enslaved populations were already well established. Although Dunmore aimed his proclamation primarily at Virginia to encourage submission of that colony to royal authority, and although similar proclamations offering freedom to those enslaved who chanced running away to the British lines and British military service were broadcast later, in the American War for Independence, and probably Dunmore's proclamation had the most impact, and especially um, among those enslaved by rebel slaveholders, because remember, um, patriots during the American Revolution are the rebels in this situation. Word reached South Carolina probably fairly quickly. There was a communication, a network of communication between enslaved communities and the colonies. And so it's likely that word spread quickly, um, alarming slaveholders and likely spurring action by the enslaved. For many of the latter, John Banbury among them, um, they are recorded in the Book of Negroes. Now this is the name, the historical name given to a ledger book written in New York. We'll get to that. Um, so this book was uh, a, a record of those who successfully escaped and John and Lucy are in it. And John is in it as having escaped in 1776. So you can see the the fast timeline of what's going on here. John and Lucy are, are born in the 1740s. At some point, they are brought here to the colonies, to South Carolina to be enslaved. 75, Lord Dunmore issues his proclamation of freedom. And in 76, John leaves. And Lucy doesn't leave until a year after. We'll get to that. So a year later, John's wife Lucy escapes, following him north to the British Army and to freedom. Uh, though no direct link of causation can be drawn between Dunmore's proclamation and John and Lucy's escapes, the timing of their self-emancipation could reflect some news from Virginia. 
Both were listed in the Book of Negroes as having formerly belonged to the Declaration of Independence signer Arthur Middleton, but it's unclear from which plantation John and Lucy escaped. Remember, the Middletons owned 19 plantation properties here in South Carolina. Um, since Middleton Place Foundation is responsible for stewarding Middleton Place and all of the histories of the family who occupied it, um, then uh, it is our job to um, steward this story as well, whether John and Lucy escaped specifically from here at Middleton Place or not. It, um, researchers, so we rely heavily about on studies that have already been produced in general, sort of these bigger studies on black loyalists throughout the colonies that likely parallel the environments, the dangers, the social pressures and possible benefits that Lucy might have encountered upon her escape. Her mental and emotional states as she made a decision to self-emancipate, well, those are lost to time. Nobody's writing those down in ledgers and official historical documents, but outlining the complex social forces and frayed webs or shackles of political authorities in the early years of the revolution illuminate how and when and why she could and did act to gain and maintain her freedom. Remember that people in British North America's enslaved communities had limited avenues by which to acquire freedom before the war broke out between the colonies and the government of King George III. Some colonies offered more choices for both slaveholders and enslaved persons to pursue emancipation, including purchase and petition, but the Southern colonies with their greater enslaved populations were far more restrictive. South Carolina enacted draconian slave laws following the tumultuous years in the early half of the 1700s. These included violent revolts like the Stona Rebellion in 1739, and they were revolts which then required common action. These ended in extreme punishments and escalated repression. Running away, which could entail one or more slaves, was always a risk and failure could also entail a heavy price. The price, punishment, was endorsed by law and authorities. The pol political schism that was the American rebellion undermined, at least in the short term, the power structures that supported the institution of slavery. Dunmore cracked that power structure in November of 1775 by sanctioning what had been illegal, escape or stealing of one's self in response to an even greater unlawful act in his view, which was the act of rebellion. When Dunmore proclaimed, proclaimed a path to guaranteed freedom, he offered a new option with better odds. Although he may have seen this as simply a, main, a means to the greater end of reasserting imperial control, the enslaved population saw freedom as the greater end. And his offer became too enticing to pass up for large swaths of the enslaved population. Dunmore and his commanders worked diligently to collect black loyalists, they were called. Um, and there's the book of Negroes and John and Lucy's records in it. We'll see that view again, folks. Um, remember that South Carolinian, South Carolinians, uh, they executed Thomas Jeremiah a free black seaman and pilot convicted for plotting insurrection and to help the Royal Navy vessels enter Charlestown Harbor in August of 1775. After that, numerous blacks, 500 documented, escaped to Sullivan's Island to join the British. And if you know anything about the 28th day of June, 1776, an anniversary that just passed, that was the great battle of Sullivan's Island, now called Fort Moultrie in which the uh, rebel patriots actually um, did manage to rebel, uh, repel the British fleet in the harbor. So earlier than that, a man called Thomas Jeremiah Free Black was convicted, although um, there wasn't any evidence to suggest that he engaged in this act. He was convicted of um, helping Royal Navy vessels enter the harbor. So Dunmore, after his proclamation did work to collect black loyalists. He wanted to form what he called the Ethiopian regiment. And 
there are various depictions throughout history. And on the right here, you can see newer depictions of what um, some black loyalists, some men in the army may have looked like. The Ethiopian regiment was a fighting force made up of former slaves and it numbered around 300 men. There is some dispute as to whether that regiment's companies were engaged at what became the Battle of Great Bridge, Virginia in December of 1775, but it appears that black soldiers did participate. Dunmore's Ethiopian regiment and other freedmen certainly had other opportunities to serve in combat or other roles. Dunmore's subordinates took their cue from him and created companies of support and construction workers called the Black Pioneers. And that's the image on the far right of the screen. That fellow is representing a Black Pioneer. Each of these companies' success varied by degrees, but stories of their endeavors probably spread much like the news of the proclamation. So um, conversation between John and Lucy on the Middleton plantation at night after their work was complete, maybe it included discussion of these new and daring opportunities for a life of freedom. How might they have balanced the practical logistics of attempting such a feat against the psychological toll of taking one's life into his or her own hands? How many times was the idea of running away dismissed as mere fantasy? How many times was it more empowering than frightening to consider? Well, we can't answer these questions directly. Oops, sorry. So I'll dig that one. But the outcome for John and Lucy and thousands of others suggests that not only did they deem it worthwhile to take the risk, they decided that it was more practicable for them to do it separately. Well, the stories of men escaping to the British Army are fairly easy to follow. Although men aren't usually individually detailed, their service is documented in the lists of Black Loyalist regiments. And the duties and services of those regiments are documented. George Washington himself recognized the military threat to his cause that raising Black Loyalist regiments presented. And although he never fully sanctioned the recruitment of escaped enslaved men to the Continental Army, he and some other commanders accepted Black recruits to supplement regiments. So remember that uh, free Blacks escaped enslaved people, they fought on both sides of this conflict. Integrating black soldiers into established regiments was one thing, raising African-American regiments was another. John Lawrence was a fan of this and wanted it for the Continental Army. Um, many of the movers and shakers of the Continental cause were largely aware of the moral objections to holding humans in bondage, but awareness was one thing and action was another. Forcing servitude on others during their, due to their continent of origin and color of their skin went against the enlightenment ideals that informed some of the formative principles of the United States Republic. George Mason here on your right and Alexander Hamilton on the left, one a slave owner from Virginia and the other an immigrant and a supposed abolitionist, although He's been tied to the purchase and sale of enslaved people for his family members. Apparently, both of these men rejected the practice of enslaving people, and they both espoused ideas about eventual emancipation. So it's incredible to think about the moral obligation versus actually taking action. During the Revolutionary War, Hamilton wrote to John Lawrence. He wanted to support Lawrence's attempts to raise a black patriot regiment, though he didn't expect it would work. Hamilton cites prejudice and private interest as hindrances to what public good might come of such an action. Even the animated and persuasive elegance, he writes, of my young Demosthenes will not be able to dissolve the fascinating character of self-interest. So Hamilton even writes acknowledging that People may object morally, but acting in their own self-interest and acting to continue a life to which people are accustomed is always going to win out. And Hamilton was right. 
He was right about the power of prejudiced interests and resistance to the formation of a black regiment for the Continental Army. And this was an obstacle that in the South was never surmounted. Still, some of the self-emancipated men who enlisted for the Patriot cause with the same hope for independence as their loyalist counterparts were actually the longest serving members of the Continental Forces. They served with distinction in the North at the Battle of Rhode Island, as well as in the South, maintaining the presence at the siege and subsequent surrender of the Battle of Yorktown. So, talking a lot about men, I know we're trying to get to Lucy Banbury, I promise, stick with me. Um, we talked about those black pioneers and it's very probable that that was something that John Banbury was engaged in. He may have become a scout or a guide for the British regulars to navigate the treacherous landscapes of the Southern colonies. Other black pioneers were foragers and still more were service workers like domestic servants or porters. So what unit did John Banbury run? Was he in fact part of the army? A number of those whose names are recorded in that ledger book, the Book of Negroes, have not only their names, ages, and physical descriptions listed, but also what service they performed on behalf of the crown. Some historians suggest that the British ship captains who wrote the book would not have accepted petitions from runaways who hadn't served. John Banbury ran away in 1776, but doesn't re-emerge again in the records until 1783 in New York City. And that's when he's reunited with Lucy. John appears in the book, but he has no accompanying service record. The initial returns from the British army are spotty at best and most refer to the regiments forming starting in 1778, well after John and Lucy escape. So we're still looking for further documentation on this. In the meantime, this book is the primary source and this is where there are records of women in service to the army. Women followed both the British and the American armies out of necessity. Both offered work to women who were enslaved, formerly enslaved or free. This leads to a probable part of Lucy's story for she's not only listed in the Book of Negroes but also in the 1784 muster roll of Port Roseway Associate, Associates in Nova Scotia and in the Sierra Leone list of 1791. Such records may indicate services rendered to the British army from Lucy of her own accord, rather than being a follower of her husband who filled a laborer's niche. Unfortunately, like the nature of John's service during the war, Lucy's affiliation here is not specifically recorded. From the research work of Ruth Holmes Whitehead on the Book of Negroes, the best we can say is that both John and Lucy are recorded as having escaped to the British Army. That much is detailed and documented. Like her white counterparts, it is most likely that Lucy was a laundress or a seamstress or a nurse. It's also possible that she was employed by an officer as a cook or as a lady servant for that officer's wife. The services of women who were recorded and preserved in some instances, just like those of men in the returns of the British Army, some of which were produced prior to the Book of Negroes. Those records not only speak to former slaves' occupations, they also describe the sheer number of soldiers, workers, and followers that would have augmented the British forces. For example, the military, re re hmm, military return for Stuart's Black Company in the North indicated that the number of women and children, 6,510, women and children in this return was roughly equal to that of black men in other returns. One might even imagine that as many as 6,500 of the 22,401 male troops could have been black. If so, blacks would have constituted 25% of the British force. Though the last figure refers to male soldiers, the math is easy to calculate with similar numbers of women on the march. Remember that this is a massive group of people who are seeking their freedom because to borrow a phrase from the American Museum of the Revolution in Philadelphia, sometimes freedom wore a red coat. 
number of questions arise when piecing together what might life might have looked like for Lucy and John upon their arrivals behind the British lines. The first among those questions might be, well, how did they get there in the first place? It's unknown when the two encounter the British, but it was lucky for them that they ran away from American patriot Arthur Middleton early. In the opening days of the war, when the majority of battles and skirmishes were up north, the southern colonies were in social upheaval. Upheaval provided openings. The British army was a place to go. And uh, as the lookout for the British victory seemed initially favorable, the possibility that service with it would confirm independence was also probable. Of course, the years progress and the theater of war turns south, but things also start looking down for the British forces. James Walker suggests that as the British began to lose influence and loyalty in the Southern colonies, uh, accompanied by a more tenuous and therefore constrained authority, the enslaved workers who sought freedom were aware of this weakening. They realized that here were concentrated the largest number of blacks within the British lines and already problems had been met in trying to feed and organize them. And this led to General Sir Henry Clinton issuing orders against receiving any further petitions for refuge. So if John and Lucy had escaped later than 1776 and 77, they may not have had the chance to be free at all. There's no documentation at present, like I said, of John and Lucy's place of bondage, um, but and therefore no direct knowledge of points of origin for their escape, right? Where did they escape from? We don't exactly know, but they could have left from any of the Middleton plantations. There's not much recorded in the British documents that illuminate the experience of escape to British lines, but we can imagine that the most likely scenario for John was an escape behind the lines right here in Charleston, probably right around the time of the Battle of Fort Moultrie or Battle of Sullivan's Island. Lucy's journey to freedom a year after her husband's escape could have mirrored John's, but that's not necessarily a given. By 1777, the British uh, were retreating from Charleston. They were leaving here. They had just fought a secondary war with the Cherokee, the Native American population who was here in, the, um, in South Carolina colony. And that ended in uh, an American victory, actually. So the British had a score of Cherokee allies in the upcountry, but the Cherokee War um, ended in an American victory, which meant that the British had to withdraw. So by 1777, Lucy has a lot further to go because there aren't British army encampments in the neighborhood like there were when John escaped. So we also don't know when the two of them reunited. If he left in 76 and she left in 77, did they find each other right away? Was she able to find which unit he had become attached to as a laborer or did they not see each other again until sometime much closer to 1783 when they appear together in the Book of Negroes? Another consideration about the difficulty or ease of reuniting uh, comes from environmental hazards. The potential pitfalls were the same for all enslaved people and their, the environmental hazards were the same whether you were running away or um, still being held in bondage. We're talking about heat and humidity taking their tolls on the body. We're talking about standing water and its associate diseases from foot rot and typhoid to dysentery. There's malaria that's carried and spread by mosquitoes. And then of course the wildlife in the marshes, including alligators, all manner of snakes and mammals that prowl at night. Um, the odds were stacked against a self-emancipated enslaved person. And still with Dunmore's proclamation, those odds were probably better than trying to stay in bondage, at least in the minds of John and Lucy. It's plain uh, traveling together would have been helpful, but groups would have walked a fine line between having enough people to share the burdens of escape and being too big in number that would catch the unwanted attention of slave catchers. Angry Quig plantation owners or opportunistic British soldiers looking to sell someone back into slavery. As Walker details, they swam, 
they hiked, they stowed away in boats and wagons, they carried each other to safety with the redcoats. Through this glimpse into the physical environment, Lucy's travails come even more clearly into focus as a woman alone. It doesn't require an especially creative mind to conjure the courage, determination, and resilience that a person like Lucy needed to survive, even as the world she knew devolved into chaos. Her records are spotty between Lucy's escape in 77 and her inspection for the ship to Halifax in 1783. We don't know, like I said, whether she met up with John before her arrival in New York or with whom she traveled. There are actually several copies of this ledger book called the Book of Negroes, and there's some suggestion from one of them that Lucy and John may not have been the only Banberries to escape. Tom Kane and his wife, Scylla, are listed as Scylla Banbury in one copy, and they are the entries just under John and Lucy. Though Tom and Scylla are documented as having escaped in 1776, so were they traveling with John maybe? All four sailed together from Nova Scotia, or for Nova Scotia from New York in 1783. So we know that they were at least reunited by then, uh, not just John and Lucy, but possibly with other kin as well. They all sailed on a ship called La Bondance, and it was under the command of Lieutenant Phillips. John and Lucy are listed as having been inspected on the same day, July 31st of 1783, at France's Tavern in New York City. That's an historic site that is still actively engaged in telling its own history today. The muster lists, lists of the ships that sailed for Nova Scotia were eventually compiled into this Book of Negroes, and they were a direct result of a British officer named Sir Guy Carleton addressing what um, was once called a provisional agreement that was signed at the end of the Revolutionary War. Article 7 of this provisional agreement uh, details the return of property to Americans upon departure of the British forces, and it was left to Carleton to decide what property meant. Well, Carleton decided that property did not include people. He wrote that his Britannic majesty shall with all convenient speed and without causing any destruction of carrying away any Negroes or other property of the American inhabitants withdraw all his army garrisons and fleets from the United States and from every port, place, and harbor within the same. The Patriot slave owners petitioned Carleton and his board of inquiry to reclaim their lost property, but he determined that refugees who had resided within the British lines at least 12 months were free to depart. They weren't property, they were free people. Further, Carleton determined that blacks who were already with the British before the 30th of November, 1782, and who claimed freedom by the proclamations were technically free and could therefore not be considered as American property on that date. Now, Carleton received pushback in particular from where one very prominent American named George Washington. And uh, Carleton did not capitulate. He did not acquiesce to Washington's wishes to have all what Washington considered all American property return. Instead, he allowed uh, people like John and Lucy to go free. Surely, Lucy and John Banbury, Tom and Scylla Kane, and, and many others, recorded and unrecorded, experienced trepidation uh, there was a twice escaped former slave named Boston King who described the experience of waiting for Carleton to decide whether he would return them. Boston King said, I quote, this dreadful rumor filled us all with inexpressible anguish and terror, especially when we saw our old masters coming from Virginia North Carolina and other parts and seizing upon their slaves in the streets of New York or even dragging them out of their beds. Many of the slaves had very cruel masters so that the thoughts of returning home with them embittered life to us. For some days we lost our appetite for food and sleep 
departed from our eyes. Surely, Lucy, John, Tom, and Scylla, they experienced similar trepidation in sleepless nights. So imagine their relief when they were finally able to board La Bombance and sail for Nova Scotia. We see here the ledger of the Port Roseway Associates and highlighted in red the record of John and Lucy's arrival in Birchtown in Nova Scotia in September of 1783. Now, part of the movement of former enslaved people to Nova Scotia was that um, the British colonists there, or rather the British government that still main, maintained a hold on this colony was supposed to provide, they were supposed to um, provide sustenance, farms, land. Basically there was a proclamation by the British saying that no one need become a wage laborer. And uh, there's no mention of racial distinction amongst said loyalists being made because remember John and Lucy um, escaped enslaved people, they're not the only ones heading to Nova Scotia. Loyalists of all races were boarding ships to depart American colonies for colonies still under British rule. So it was the intention of the British government to provide loyalists with compensation for their losses. Unfortunately, problems of land and provision shortages arose in mid 1783 before John and Lucy even arrived. And much like the country they had just left, preferential treatment was given to white loyalists because it was determined that those who were perceived to have lost the most when departing for Nova Scotia should be landed and provisioned first. Often there was little or nothing left for black loyalists, even those arriving in the earliest waves of 1783, like John and Lucy. And not just that, enslavement was still practiced in the colony of Nova Scotia by those of European descent. And that meant that Lucy and John arrived into another unpredictable scenario. Sentiments against freedom for people of African descent continued, probably due to a long ingrained understanding of American slavery as a means to exploit humans for work and economic gain. And I quote, blacks were usually considered to be nothing but a source of labor. It was this economic attitude taken by white people rather than any identifiable belief in racial inferiority that was caused to the most discriminatory situations. John described in the muster book of free black settlement of Birchtown as a laborer, surely fell into the trap of being a construction worker or a wage laborer, precisely the employment which the crown promised would not be necessary upon gaining freedom. Yet free and still enslaved blacks could mingle at will here in Birchtown and enslavers quickly lost their holds on their human property, both physically and psychologically. It was difficult for slaveholders to maintain a mental system of oppression upon a people in bondage when those enslaved saw others who looked just like them and yet were free. When, how, and whether Lucy and John received acreage and provisions from the government is a mystery, but we do know that eventually John and Lucy owned land in Birchtown. It was one of three all black settlements in Nova Scotia. The average land grant to black loyalists was supposed to be 50 acres in contrast to the 160 acres that was recommended for white loyalists, but whether John and Lucy received all 50 and sold some or whether they never received 50 acres at all is lost to history. What we do know is that by 1791, John and Lucy had 10 acres of their own. Whether they purchased it or were given it, we don't know. And we know that that 10 acres was listed as part of which is improved by the government. In November, of 1791, we pick up Lucy's trail again. And this time it's without John. His year of death isn't recorded, 
but by November of 1791, Lucy applies for removal to Sierra Leone in Africa, and she applies alone. There's another ledger book. It's called The List of Blacks in Birchtown Who Gave Their Names for Removal to Sierra Leone in November of 1791. And this reveals the final leg of Lucy's journey. I've highlighted her there in the red boxes again. After living in Birchtown for eight years and presumably creating a life both with and then without her husband, Lucy applies to be removed to Africa and is granted passage. This list reveals some of the few known details of Lucy's life. One of the most interesting and pertinent pieces of information is a disclosing of her birthplace. Lucy is listed and identified herself as having been born in Africa, which means that this application for removal to Sierra Leone was a decision to go home. One can imagine many thoughts and emotions that might have accompanied the pursuit of this particular opportunity for a self-emancipated woman who likely thought she would never set foot on her native continent again. And there are other details that are arguably less important, but they're useful for developing the richness and complexity of Lucy's life including the minutia of her occupations, her belongings, listed out in the form of a ledger. Lucy is described as a farmer. She owned an ax, one hoe, 10 acre lot improved by the government, a chest, two pieces of other portable property and luggage, and a certificate of good character, without which she would not have gained access to this opportunity to be removed to Sierra Leone. Lucy embarked for Africa with the company enumerated in this long ledger and her last known whereabouts sailed with her. To date, Middleton Place has neither found nor received record of those who successfully landed in Sierra Leone in 1792, but there's little reason to doubt that Lucy, whose lifetime of arduous travels took her thousands of miles by land and sea, would have arrived safely. We aren't sure exactly how old she was when she departed for Sierra Leone, either 43 or 48. There's a little bit of an age discrepancy in her years of birth in these ledgers, but she was not an old woman. So we can see that she leaves from Africa in that slave trade. She makes her way to Carolina. She runs away and eventually is repatriated on the west coast of Africa in Sierra Leone. It's left to the imagination to consider what her first steps in Sierra Leone must have felt like, whether she found peace on home soil, even if she never returned to her specific country of origin. As Walker notes again in his study of black loyalists, land, independence and security had in fact been among the chief attractions drawing the fleeing slaves to the British during the American war. After still feeling the bonds of servitudes as laborers, engenturers, or sharecroppers in Nova Scotia, removal to Sierra Leone might have seemed like the ultimate opportunity for formerly enslaved people to accomplish these simple yet elusive goals of land, independence, and security. And the fact that Lucy already owned land of her own makes her application all the rarer and her desire for independence in a place she had strong emotional ties to all the more likely. Otherwise, why would she leave? As Walker so eloquently states, the offer not only of land, but the promised land. A farm in Nova Scotia was no substitute for an entire country in Africa. We can only imagine if that's how Lucy felt when making her decision, but we may certainly hope that the result was worth all of her sacrifices. As we look at the different ways that Lucy is described in all of these books and ledgers and historical records, she's described as Lucy Banbury, 40, a stout wench, formerly the property of Arthur Middleton of Charlestown, South Carolina, left him six years ago, 
escaped to the British army, 1777, embarked on L'Abondance under the command of Lieutenant Phillips after inspection in New York, 31 July, 1783, arrived in Port Roseway, Shelburne, Nova Scotia, resided on 10 acres in Birchtown, applied for removal to Sierra Leone, November, 1791. Wife, farmer, certified a woman of good character, but nowhere in the ledgers recording Lucy's life are the following entries. So I would like to add them now. Resilient, determined, perseverant, hopeful, faithful, courageous, independent, and free. Lucy is one of the rare few. She gained her freedom and she gained it in her own way. She took it. I am really grateful to have had the opportunity to research Lucy and the research isn't concluded. We have to continue to see if we can find more of her story. But if any of you have any questions, um, if you have any uh, research to offer, <laughs> let me know. I'll be sure to continue to update Middleton Place's social media um, as the this article is potentially published. I'll make sure to let you all know where you can find it. And let me know if you have any questions. I haven't seen any come through. I've been watching my comment section on the phone. Um, if you have any comments or questions for me, let me know. You know where to find me right here on social. And um, other than that, I thank you so much. Now, there is one more thing I forgot to share, um, but I'm not gonna go back and share my screen. I'll just tell you all about it tomorrow. I am honored to participate in a digital and online free conference called the Light of Truth Conference. And I'm gonna drop, um, I'm gonna drop the link to it right here in the comments section, lighttruthcon.com. So I've been invited to speak about the historical foundations of systems of oppression. This is a teach-in called uh, Turning on the Light of Truth, and it's about um, social justice and how uh, people can take action uh, towards creating a better future. And I'm really honored to have been asked to talk about how Middleton Place as a foundation not only maintains our mission of stewarding history, but about how we are using that mission in an active way to help create a more equitable future. So um, turning on the light of truth, and it is right there, www.lighttruthcon.com. It's a free teach-in. It's every Wednesday for the next five Wednesdays from 1 to 2 p.m. each week. And tomorrow is the very first session and it's called Historical Foundations of Systems of Oppression. So we'll be talking a little bit about Middleton Place's um, work there and certainly continuing to tell Lucy's story and get it out there is a big part of how we need to do that. So thank you all so much for tuning in to this episode of Let's Talk Tuesday. On Thursday, we'll be doing Explore More Thursday, and you're going to see my face again, oh my gosh, twice in one week in front of the camera. I will be there with one of our great interpreters, Bob, talking about the Continental Army encamping right next door at Ashley Hill. So the Continental Army was here at Middleton Place, and we'll be talking about that on Thursday. So we'll see you at noon on Thursday. Hopefully, I'll see you tomorrow at 1 p.m. Thank you so much. Every time you all join us, every time you engage uh, every time you donate, uh, you are helping us to provide Plugged Into History as a free service for all of our audience. So thank you so much, and we'll see you soon. Bye.